Good morning, welcome back. This is Daybreak and thank you for staying with us. The hashtag on X is Daybreak. The SMS code is 22422 at uh, Citizen TV Kenya and at Ayub Abdikadin and also at Safin underscore Cheng will sample your feedback in the course of this broadcast. With me in studio is Dr. Jackson Koimbori, who is the Senior Circular Economy and the Climate Change Coordinator with the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your time. Thank you so Always much. appreciated your company, especially on this topical area. Helen Denner is uh, the project lead, Pan-Africa Plastics Project, Greenpeace Africa. Good morning. Good morning. Ayo. Thank you for your time as well. Much appreciated. And we also have Amos Wemanya, who is the Senior Climate Policy Advisor with PowerShift Africa. Good morning. Good morning. Good we evening. thank you your time, Amos, for being with us here on the broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be, of course, centering around, around the climate question and uh, whether time is running out. And starting with you, Amos, is, is the speed of the time and uh, the globally set goals vis-a-vis -vis the actions of the world commensurate, are they equal? Yeah, uh, I think we're living in an emergency. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're in an emergency, you need to behave as if you're in one. Um, it has taken world leaders a very long time, for example, to acknowledge the main cause of the climate crisis, which is the fossil fuels. But um, I'm happy that um, in the last convening that happened in Dubai, world leaders actually agreed to transition away from fossil fuels, yeah. which is a big start. But also, when you look at a continent like ours, yeah. uh, we are facing huge impacts of the climate crisis that we did not contribute much to causing the problem. Yeah. Uh, what our people need right now is means of being able to adapt to the crisis. The droughts, the floods. Um, a few years ago, we saw the locusts destroying um, our crops and uh, making our communities more vulnerable by losing livelihoods. I think we need mechanisms of helping these communities to be able to cope with these impacts. Science is very clear yeah. that uh, we are on a trajectory to overshoot safe limits. Um, and in 2015, the world set a limit of uh, 1.5 degrees with only about 1.1 degree temperature rise. That is the, the Paris Climate The Paris Accord. Climate um, Agreement. Okay. That the world needs to limit uh, global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees for us to avoid a catastrophic future. Uh, but uh, when you look at the current science, you realize that we are on a trajectory to overshoot that. We are on a trajectory actually to about 2.7. And right now, the world has only warmed on average of about 1.1 degrees. And we can see the chaos. Yeah. Uh, if we are going to overshoot 1.5, it's going to be more catastrophic for people. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be disasters on a daily basis. And I think we need to act. We need to act, act urgently and take bold decisions to be able mm -hmm. to have a future. OK, Amos, let's now descend down and uh, speak to the hearts of the common man and the woman in Kenya. In the context of now the uh, climate debate, we'll be talking about what happened in the aftermath of the Paris Climate Accord. We went to Glasgow in the UK, then headed to Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, then to Dubai, not forgetting the Nairobi Climate uh, Summit in September last year. But for the common man and woman, say in Wote, Makwene County, interestingly, it hosted the 2021 multi-level governance for climate action, which was themed the devolution conference then. How do they understand that the both extremes you're experiencing, one is out of the drought period into now the flooding, both extremes, and what are the actions that they can take? And how then do you simplify the message to them that these are the consequences of climate change and you need to do A, B, C, D? Yeah, um, you realize that our communities, especially here in Kenya, have been very sustainable. When you look at the agricultural activities that they undertake, they have not been using a lot of agrochemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been um, living in harmony with nature. We have learned to produce from what nature provides us. Uh, but uh, times are changing. And now you realize that uh, uh, we can no longer rely uh, successfully yeah. on nature-based uh, um, nature provision 
for example, we can't rely on rain-fed agriculture anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because when we need rains for us to plant, they are not coming. And when they come, sometimes they are coming in large torrents causing floods, like you rightly mentioned. So we need to adapt our systems. For example, when the rains fade, yeah. farmers can continue producing using irrigation systems. Mm -hmm. They will need energy, for example, to be able to power these irrigation systems. In this country, we are blessed with abundant renewable energy resources, yeah. from solar to wind to geothermal. Solar actually has the potential for small-scale decentralized systems that are able to help our farmers not to lose when the rains fail, but to continue producing. So what we need in this country is policies that are going to allow these farmers, these communities that are on the front line of the climate crisis, to be able to access these technologies, yeah. to be able to access these solutions. And that can be in forms of subsidies for a very long time. We have subsidized the fossil industry yes. and made it look like it's cheaper. Yeah. You remember when the current president came into power and stopped subsidizing oil? The prices of oil shoot up. Overshoot. Mm -hmm. So these resources need to be divided to systems that are going to provide for our communities. Okay. What if we subsidize solar equipment so that our farmers are able to access this equipment yeah. for continued production, yes. even when the rains fade. All right. Um, Helen, c coming to you then. Is it then challenging to see the big polluters, for example, and of course leading the project uh, um, uh, Greenpeace Africa with regards to its Pan-African uh, Plastics uh, project, that uh, out of these COP conferences and, and the climate uh, I mean, gatherings, that we see mechanisms but no commitments from the big polluters, the Indians, the Americans, um, the Europeans. And Africa, apparently, where you champion for its cause, is, does not contribute as much as these countries do, but ends up paying the price and, and bears the consequences of this climate catastrophe. How do we get out of this very complex situation that is very puzzling? Absolutely, and, and the issue here, like you rightly mentioned, it has to do with the big polluters because a lot of the time, even in these negotiations, and uh, Amos can bear me witness that they come into the room with an already preformed mind, and a lot of the time it's to protect their own business interests. So um, the big oil producers, the big fossil fuel um, companies will come there with uh, an intention of uh, us not moving forward in terms of getting the commitments. So for them, it's actually always putting profit before people and the planet. And, uh, and for us, uh, when, uh, even in the plastic um, uh, scenario, uh, because as we all know, you know, 99% of plastic is made from fossil fuel. Yeah. So it also, you know, uh, drives the climate, you know, uh, climate crisis. If you look at uh, plastic production, the more we produce, the more we need fossil fuel. And these people are pushing an agenda here because at the end of the day for them, its business, it has to get to a point where uh, countries have to come together and agree that we are living in a, uh, in a, in a situation where if we continue in the same tra trajectory, then yeah. uh, the consequences will be dire. And Emos has already alluded to the fact that we are already in those, uh, you know, facing those consequences. Mm. If you look, for instance, um, a few months ago, we experienced uh, Cyclone Freddy, uh, you know, in the southern parts of, of Africa. A few years ago, we yeah. never used to experience such, you know, extreme weather events. And that led to more than a thousand people dead and, you know, uh, a lot of uh, millions of, 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 of uh, um, you know, resources had, had been destroyed because of that. So the more we, we continue in the same manner, the more we are going to face these droughts. And when we come back here home, we have experienced uh, last year the worst drought in 40 years. And right after that, we went to El Nino. And, and it's also, this year is also projected to be one of the hottest years that we've ever faced. So we can't not afford to let these, uh, you know, big oil producers really control, you know, the narrative, control the negotiations, especially in this big climate, uh, you know, negotiation. But more than that, we need to see action beyond the yeah. commitments because, um, you know, 
our governments and all stakeholders are really big at talking and really big at making commitments. But until it gets to a point where we are seeing action, we are yeah. seeing that, you know, if you're talking about adaptation, what is the framework that is in place for us to, en to enable, um, you know, even communities and other stakeholders to yes. be brought on board so mm -hmm. that we are all moving towards the same, um, you know, uh, agenda. Until that happens, then it will just be a lot of talk. Yeah. Dr. Koenbori, the concluded COP28 climate conference, you are there in Dubai, concluded with an agreement marking the start of the end to fossil fuel era and, and emphasizes a swift, equitable transition towards deep emission cuts and increased finance for climate action. And for example, the Danish government pledged $232 million for green climate funds, second replenishment, replenishment, the Africa Development Bank, 1 billion USD towards adaptation and pledged to invest further 25 billion by climate financing by 2025, the Bezos Earth Fund, 22.8 million USD, the Climate Asset Management, 200 million USD, Mazda, 200, that's Mazda, MSDAR, 10 billion USD, Camco, 100 million USD. Given all these commitments that have been given, how then can the transition happen so fast that they match the speed of the consequences and people bearing the brunt of the climate change? So uh, first of all, let me thank you for the invite today. And before I continue, let me just say where KEPSA comes in eh, as the Kenya private sector lands. Uh, just a brief uh, summary, just one, the 30 seconds is uh, KEPSA is the umbrella body or the apex body of the private sector uh, with our main sole purpose of uh, bringing together the local and the foreign uh, business associations, the Chamber of Commerce, together with professional bodies, together with SMEs mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on, on the same platform with an aim of unifying and amplifying their voices when it comes to us dealing with the government, dealing with the investors, dealing with stakeholders. So in this regard, uh, I want to say COP28 was a good platform. Okay. Uh, they were able to onboard the private sector, realizing that the private sector are the, were the key missing link when it comes to the to that chain of ensuring that we move from strategy to action. So what you're talking about here in terms of climate finance and the pledges they have put forth, uh, the private sector play a key role here. Okay. And uh, putting in mind that there was a research which was done a while back showing that about 70% of the global emissions come from the private sector. So for you to talk about moving forward, we'll have to focus on Article 10 of the Paris Agreement, which is basically touching on the transformation of technology, that is technology development and transformation in terms of technology innovation. So this finance, we as the private sector, we see it as an opportunity where we can be able to use this money in terms of creating innovative solutions that will be able to embrace circular economy and even ensure that we move towards green renewable economy, which will create green jobs. So our, your question, going back to your question, is that uh, our main thing now is to move away from strategy into action. Okay. We are no longer asking for the seat. We are, not, we are now asking to sit down. We are now moving from, act, from that strategy to action. And this is something that uh, we are calling forth to all even the private sectors who are not yet members with KEPSA to come on board because whenever we are pitching out for these ideas, whenever we are negotiating for these policies, which sometimes uh, were not creating environmentally friendly environment for the business sectors, this is one key area. So whenever we are together, uh, we become much more stronger. Our voice becomes more amplified and the climate finance is one avenue that we are focusing on within KEPSA and that's why we have a department on climate business information network. And also we have ones on sustainability with a main focus of ensuring that these investors and business people who come in, we give them avenues. We tell them, you have an industry. Why can't you use an alternative source of energy like solar? Because at the end of the day, you'll be able to create more uh, green jobs. You'll be able to get carbon credits from all this. So the bottom line here is sustainable businesses lead to sustainable jobs. 
So I think that is the bottom line uh, as we progress. Okay, Amos, given that uh, the COP28 climate conference signaled the beginning of fossil uh, fuel era and uh, the agreement was generally bordered on consensus building, mm -hmm. unlike when Alok Sharma, the president of the 2021 climate conference in Glasgow in the UK, almost shed a tear because of the start of between the Saudis on one side, the Chinese, the Indians, and also the, the, the Europeans and the Americans. How did the Nairobi Climate Declaration in September last year help build the momentum towards this, which signaled the end of fossil fuel in Dubai? It happened in September, then October, November, we were in December, we were in Dubai. Was it that critical that Africa went there with one voice? It was very important. And uh, you remember that um, at the Africa Climate Summit here in Nairobi, there was a very strong declaration around renewables that uh, African leaders you see, then there was a global political discussion around tripling renewables. But African leaders actually committed to moving from 56 gigawatts mm -hmm. to 300, which is more than tripling. And uh, um, this set a momentum that the world needs to invest in renewables. So in as much as at COP28, the world did not agree to phase out fossil fuel. Yeah. They agreed to transition away mm -hmm. from fossil fuel. And there is one element that you mentioned, which is very important, the element of equity. Uh, what does equity mean? It means that uh, you can't really expect, for example, a country such as Mozambique or DRC mm -hmm. uh, to move out of fossil fuel before Norway and Canada of this world. We have one challenge within the climate discussions uh, regime, that we agree at a global stage, then when countries get back home, they start doing exactly the opposite. Uh, for example, you find um, UK reopening its mines and commissioning new coal mines, contrary to the agreements in these global spaces. You see, humanity is on a brink, and we have an opportunity of a lifetime to take a decision. I'm hoping that the decision that was taken in Dubai will be followed through. How is it going to be followed through? One by historical emitters taking responsibility mm -hmm. and quickly and urgently uh, moving out of fossil fuels, facing out all fossil fuels, but also stopping the expansion of fossil fuels in Africa. Because on our continent of Africa, fossil fuels are not very new. Mm -hmm. We have had many African countries produce oil, but this oil, has it benefited these countries? The answer is no. It has left these countries without electricity, it has left these countries without development. So we need a new energy system that is going to help our people who have been held under uh, poverty and under development for a long time, who are in the dark yeah. uh, because of an energy system that is not serving them, to be able to overcome these challenges, to be able to use a new energy system that is able to power new economic activities that are going to help them to build resilience to the climate crisis. But Africans need a means to be able to implement this. Mm -hmm. We need finance, we need technology. Uh, the finance bit uh, at the Africa Climate Summit, yeah. it was estimated that for Africa to move from 56 to 300 gigawatts by 2030, it will require every year uh, for Africa to spend $100 billion, um, which translates to $600 billion mm -hmm. by 2030. Um, we are talking about a continent that is suffering economic challenges because of a crisis they did not contribute to. So we expect, in the spirit of international cooperation and solidarity, yeah. our, our friends who have developed on the back of pollution yeah. to help Africa to be able to implement new energy systems that are going to help our community. To be part of that financing program. For sure. Okay, well, Ellen, when we get back from the break, I'll also come uh, to you on that because it's also conflicting when on one side we are part of the cheerleading team across the world that champions for no fossil fuel but some african countries still are using fossil fuel then how we can therefore do a moderation of that even as we see finances from those who are the big polluters the hashtag on x is daybreak the sms code is double two four double two at citizen tv kenya and at ayub abdikader when we get back from daybreak the discussion continues here on the broadcast stage.